Hello and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History and the 28th Annual American Indian Heritage Celebration Education Day. Our presenter, Chi Chipman. I'm sorry, Chi Shipman. I apologize, Chi. I am excited to be here. We'll begin in just a moment, but we want to start with a few notes. We have many additional resources available on American Indians in North Carolina on our website, nc-aihc.com. We thank the following sponsors of the North Carolina Museum of History Foundation, helping to make this event possible. Nole, Tal Ieni, Anake Huge, Donkey Ka, Enola, Nole, Joanna Dunado, Tal Ieni, Gethli, Donkey Ka, Chubarka, Nole, Kira Dundo, Agihe, Brandon Shipman Dudo, Nole, Agizi, Marva Welts Dudo. Hello, everyone. My name is Chi Shipman, and I am a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. and. What did you just hear me do? I spoke my language. So for the past four years, I've been learning Cherokee language. So I told you that I had two daughters, Joanna and Enola. I told you I had two dogs, Chewbarka and Kira. And I told you my husband's name and my mother's name, just so that you could hear a little bit of my language. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why Cherokee language is in the state that it's in. and also share a little bit about what we are doing to continue to teach our language and continue to learn our language. So I work for the Kadua Education Preservation, um, which we call KPEP in Cherokee, North Carolina, and I teach Cherokee language to adults. So next slide. So a little bit about myself, like I, like I told you in the beginning, I'm a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I have two daughters. This is an older picture, um, but I have a 14 year old and a seven year old. Um, and I'm the adult language education coordinator for KPEP. And like I said, I teach adults for a living. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, because I grew up in Cherokee and I grew up with a family that was Cherokee, but we didn't speak our language. Um, we learned a little, you know, learned about who I was and what it meant to be Cherokee. But until I went on a bike ride in 2012, um, I, I really then started to learn what it was to be a Cherokee person. I went on a bike ride called the Remember the Removal Ride. So every year in the month of June, seven riders go and they trace the northern route of the Trail of Tears. So they do this in remembrance of all the people that were removed from the Cherokee Nation in the East and moved to Indian country in the West. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a little bit. But on this ride, I learned a lot more of what it was to be a Cherokee person. Um, what my ancestors went through and the struggles that they faced. And I wanted to know more. I wanted to share more. I wanted to educate. So that led me to go to Aotearoa, which is New Zealand. And in New Zealand, I went with a group from the RTR, because like I said, we do it every year. So a group of us went to um, share research at a conference. And in New Zealand, everyone that is Maori, not everyone, but most everyone that is Maori, they speak Maori. And when we went to go visit them, we couldn't speak English. When we went into their place to introduce ourselves and to greet each other, it is a no English zone. Like you can only speak Maori or your native language. Now, as a Cherokee person, I was never taught my language. So I learned a little bit of it in school, like just a little bit, but like not enough to be fluent. And so I just had to sit there. I had to sit there, not say anything and listen to everyone else speak. And in doing that, I became really ashamed. 
I was really ashamed that I hadn't taken the time to learn my language and the fact that I couldn't communicate, it made me sad too. I was just really sad and I was like, all right, when I get back, I'm going to learn my language. Like I made it a goal. I'm going to learn what I can learn and figure that out. Well, I get home and not even, I think three months after I get home from New Zealand, I come across a Facebook post looking for adult learners to come and learn Cherokee language. So I applied and got accepted. So I spent the next two years working with our first language speakers um, to learn Cherokee language. Now, I have definitely not become fluent. I am still on like a toddler, teenager language level because Cherokee language is extremely hard language to learn. And I'll share more of that in just a minute. So why did I not learn my language growing up? Why did my mom not teach me? My grandparents were fluent, but why didn't I learn from them? Well, my grandparents passed away when I was very young, and then my mom didn't learn. And a lot of that is because of boarding schools. It is because the U.S. government um, sent native, native people to boarding schools, not just Cherokee, but all native peoples, all the way up until, I want to say, close to the 60s. I want to say, don't hold me to that. We can fact check later. Um, but they sent native kids to boarding schools. And in those boarding schools, they cut their hair. They didn't let them learn or speak their language and they can only speak English. So in that process, languages were lost. Some languages were lost to the point where it's going to be really hard for those people to get them back. They were not very nice places, but there were some nice places. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that and why we even assimilated. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so before I get to all of that and telling you about the boarding schools, and I wanted to share a little bit about what Cherokee territory looked like when European settlers came to America. So this is a Royce map. This is a map that each color is a treaty or something that where we gave land for goods, for money, for whatever we needed. We succeeded these lands to the US, to the government. So each color represents a block of land that was traded in some way or another in a treaty. So it just shows how vast and how large um, Cherokee territory was. It encompassed eight states. Just take a minute and think about that. Eight states. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, Kentucky. I think there's a little bit of Ohio, Illinois in there. So, I mean, there was, there was eight states. It was a huge, vast area of land. So this just is a nice representation. And you can go online and just look up Royce Map and um, look at all the different areas yourself. So where is Cherokee Territory today? Cherokee Territory today is um, in Western North Carolina um, in Cherokee. So if you can see on the map, there's a, there is a gold dot. That big gold dot is where Cherokee is, and that's it. That's all the land that we have. So think back to that big map with all of that land, and then it shrunk down to this itty bitty space. Now, how did we get this land? The US government did give uh, native nations reservations. Well, Cherokee's not a reservation, it's a boundary. How did it become a boundary? Well, um, a gentleman named William Holland Thomas he was adopted by a Cherokee man. He was a Cherokee, he was fluent in Cherokee language, but he was a white US citizen. 
So what did that mean? That meant that William, William Holland Thomas could own land because as a Cherokee person, we couldn't own land at that time, but he could. So what did he do? He went up and started buying land left and right and holding it in trust for us. So when the time came, we were able to buy our land and have a place here in Western North Carolina. Um, next slide. So like I said earlier, we had um, boarding schools. Now as Cherokee people, um, we, we got, I wanna say lucky-ish. Um, we had a day school that was on the boundary. And then we also had a snowbird day school which was in Robbinsville, which is about an hour from Cherokee. And they're part of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians as well. Um, the Snowbird Day School was run by two wonderful people that allowed Cherokee kids to speak their language, to think in a way of Cherokee thinking. And so with the bad was also good. Um, I have a quote on here from R.H. Pratt, and he was famously said to kill the Indian, but save the man. And that's what boarding schools did. They wanted to take the Indian out of these children and make them more white, make them more English. And in doing that, like I said, a lot of things were lost. So that brings us to Cherokee language, to my language. Um, it's a little different. So I'll, on the screen, I have a picture of Sequoia. So Sequoia was a Cherokee man, and he spent six years developing a writing system for Cherokee language. Cherokee language was an oral language up until this point, until about, I think it was, it was a little under 200 years ago he did this. But we didn't write things down and we had to be very specific with what we said because we didn't write things down. And I'll explain more about that later. But as you see, Sequoia came up with a writing system and he, like I said, he spent six years. Everyone thought he was crazy because he sat up in his cabin for six years, didn't come out, and he was creating a writing system. His first draft, his wife got mad. She burnt it. And he had to start all over again. So he started all over again and he succeeded. Now, the syllabary that you see on your screen is a little different than the syllabary that Sequoia would have originally wrote. Um, that was very cursive looking. If anybody is learning cursive in school, or if you even look at really old documents um, from the 15, 1600s, it's all written in cursive, right? Well, Cherokee language started like that, but now it looks more like this. Does anybody see anything that looks kind of familiar? Maybe some letters in there that kind of look like English letters. Well, there's a reason for this. So you see in that top line, there's like a capital D. You'll see a capital W um, and you'll see a capital L. Why do we have these block English looking letters now? because of tintype. So the Cherokee people had a, a newspaper written in just Cherokee language. It was called the Cherokee Phoenix. So whenever there was printing presses, you had to have the tintype so that, you know, they would lay all the, all the words out and then they would put the paper on it and print it. Well, it was a lot cheaper to use some tintype that was English and kind of, okay, that looks like this character. Okay, that one looks like this character because it saved money. So that's why we have some syllabary characters that look like English letters today. Um, it's not an alphabet, it's a syllabary. And we're gonna go over some of the sounds 
that are in Cherokee language. So if you look at that very top line, the um, first one is a, a, e, o, u, uh. So it sounds a lot like English sounds, just a little bit when you're learning your, um, your vowels. There we go. Sorry, had a moment. <laughs> when you're learning your vowels, a, e, a, o, u, uh. So very similar in sound, but not quite English. Um, we have two writing systems that we use. Uh, we have the syllabary characters that you see in the bold, and then beside them on the right is the phonetic sound. So the English equivalent to the syllabary character. Um, and a few things that look a little different, like I think the biggest thing for me is when I saw an I written, I wanted to make the I sound, but you make an E sound. Um, so little things like that you kind of get used to, but they throw you off when you're reading syllabary or reading the phonetic. So who teaches, who teaches us? Well, I have seven first language speakers that come and work with us Monday through Thursday um, for 24 hours a week. And they let us pick their brain, essentially. Um, we sit there and we ask them how to say things. We have conversations in the language. Um, and they're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, they are the ones that their parents, when they came home from boarding schools, like a lot of these, a lot of these speakers went, they went to day school. They went to day boarding school. And when they would come home, their parents would still speak to them because their parents hadn't, have maybe not gotten as mistreated when they went to boarding school or they rebelled and said, you know what? No, it doesn't matter. We're going to speak no matter what. So as you can see, um, in the top, my left, there's an elderly lady. Her name is Aizel. Um, and next to her is Mose Ukama. Um, below Aizel is Maddie Welch. And next to her is Lucille Lossie. And I'll talk a little more, more about Lucille at the end. So just keep her in your memory because she made some of the things that are on the table that I'm going to show you in a little while. Okay, but they are wonderful, wonderful people and they are so patient and they work with us every day and they've become, they've become like my grandparents. I mean, they take care of us. Um, we try to create more of a family environment at, at our work um, so that we can learn this language so we can continue to teach kids like yourself. So, like I said, let's learn a few words together, all right? So, we all want to know how to introduce ourselves, like I said at the beginning. So, let's all just start with shio. So, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to give you a second, I want you to say it back to me. So, shio. I'm sure you were all fantastic. Now, don't be scared. We're going to say it one more time. Don't be scared to just repeat it back to me. Your teachers are going to hear you. It's going to be great. Y'all are going to hear each other. So, shio. Oh, this needs a dug. I know you all did great. So, when you, in the beginning, I told you what my name was. Uday's dog would do. So, everyone say your name. And now say, dog wa do. I'm going to say it nice and slow. So, let's all say it nice and slow together. Da, gua, do. Dog would do ah. Let's try it one more time. We'll say it slow. And then once I get done, I'll pause and then we can all say it a little bit quicker. All right. One, two, three. Da, gua, do, ah. Dog would do ah. Oh, sta. That is my name is. So, shio, udates, dog would do ah. Now, 
I have on the screen as well your name, Daedza Doa, and his, her, or its name, Du Doa. So the beautiful thing about Cherokee language, it doesn't have a gender. It's genderless. Some things have gender when we talk about family members and a few other things, but for the most part, when we talk about things, it is me, you, he, she, or it. Now, we'll go into how many people you can talk about in just a minute. All right, so I have a resource page. So this is for your teachers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Cherokee language. Why is Cherokee language so hard to learn? So on that last slide, you saw that I said my name, your name, his or her name. So those are three different people that we can talk about. In the English language, when we say you all, we could be talking about any group of people. We could be talking about the people, you could be talking about the people standing in front of you. Um, in Cherokee language, it gets very specific. So the 10 people that we teach, which isn't all of them, is me, you, he, she, or it, you all, that's me talking to you all, like I am now, um, you two, like if I'm talking to just two people specifically, um, let's see, then you have me and you, but not everybody else, you have them, but not me or the person I'm talking to. <laughs> you have, and if I'm talking to someone, I could say me and her, but not you all. Me and them, but not you all. So that uh, sounds kind of confusing, right? You're like, what? Who are you talking about? So that's why Cherokee language is a little hard because you can talk. You're very specific about who you talk about. Um, it's made me have to rethink of how I talk and how I explain things because when I want to get a word, I have to be very specific when I'm asking my speakers what I want because if I'm not very specific, I may not get exactly what I want. Along with all of these people that you can talk about, there's different tenses. You know, in English, we have the present, we've got the past. And we've got, you know, like several different ways. Well, guess what? In Cherokee language, you can talk about the present. You can talk in like the just happened past. Like it just happened, like just now. It happened a day ago. It happened two years ago. It happened two years ago, but I didn't see it. So I'm going to tell you in a different way that I didn't see that happen two years ago. It's called the unexperienced past. We have experienced past. We have an action that was completed in the past. We have actions that weren't completed in the past. We have actions in the future that they're going to be completed in the future. So we say it one way. If we don't know it's going to be completed in the future, we say it another way. It's called the incompleted future. There's so many ways to talk about things in Cherokee language. So in my program, we try to simplify it and make it easier for everyone to talk. So at, in Cherokee, um, we have an immersion school. So it's called New Kadua Academy. And my youngest actually goes there. And unlike, unlike your school, you know how you buy textbooks and you, they're just there. You just have them. Well, in our school, we don't have that because we spend most of the day in Cherokee language. And we have to teach these texts and these worksheets and all these things that we have. We have to make them. So I have a few things to show you. These are just a couple of books that she gets sent home from school that we've made. And as you can see, that's not English, is it? No. It's the syllabary. They learn in the syllabary. As you can see, there's a little bit of English here because... We can't sell these. These are copyrighted books that we have translated. So we have to give credit where credit is due. And see, it talks about him being scared. 
And this is how our kids have to learn. So you can see we've just translated a book. And as you can see, it's just paper. And we have to make our own materials. So it shows we have three different books of the same character. And it is made. So that's great for our younger kids. But for our older learners, for our older children, we have... Um, some of our speakers that are translators that translate lots and lots of things um, have translated several books that we all know and love, like Charlotte's Web. Um, Myrtle and K-Pep, um, they got with um, E.B. White's family and got permission to translate Charlotte's Web. And Myrtle Johnson, she's one of our beloved women, she's one of my most favorite speakers. Shh, don't tell everybody else, but she is. She's one of my most favorite. She went through, they're all my favorite. I don't know what I'm talking about. She went through and she translated the whole book, everything. So here, I'll put it down here so that y'all can see. Can you read some <clears throat> I am not good at reading in syllabary, but I will. <laughs> but I will, I will. Um, try. I am a terrible reader in syllabary. I, and see, I've been learning for four years. This is the other struggle, y'all. I have been learning Cherokee language for four years. I've been reading syllabary for four years, and it is still very hard to just even read Cherokee in syllabary. Um, okay. Gata Tanyeshi Galu Hyasti Gata Telush or Teyeshi Galu Yasti. It's like, where, where are you going? Udanta Ne Udzi Yon Udze Udze Stone Zudoya Dani Shahashke. So, yeah. I'm going to stop there because, yeah. But, again, that's another thing that's hard. Luckily, we have this recorded as well. So, what we do is I go back to that same thing that I just read, and I'll listen to Myrtle read it. And then I can pause it, and I can say what she just said. So, then I start to sound more like her. Because what that does as well is it teaches your muscles in your mouth to start to sound more Cherokee. Because I grew up speaking English. So my muscles in my mouth are used to talking English. It's just the way it is. You use very different parts of your mouth to speak Cherokee. If you're interested in linguistics, it's super interesting how to learn other languages as a linguist they have a whole alphabet like linguist alphabet out there that if you're looking at someone's language it tells you where you make the sound in your mouth they break your mouth down and all the way down and you learn where those sounds come from because even in English we say sounds that like okay my tongue is flat and it's towards the front and that's how I make that sound. Um, so same thing goes for Cherokee language. So I try to give myself grace and I try to give my learners grace because we've all grown up speaking English. So we have to retrain our mouse to sound more Cherokee. So along with Charlotte's Web, we also, Marie Junaluska, she's one of my favorites too. See, I told you they're all my favorites. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, she um, translated Encyclopedia Brown. So that's another book that we have that we can use and go through and, and see. And we can go through and there's the syllabary and then the how to say the sounds. And we can go through and not only look at where am I going? Not only look at the Cherokee, but we have the English, the English version of it as well. So 
Cherokee doesn't always translate exactly from Cherokee to English, but it gives us an idea of what the person that translated these books was looking at, what they were thinking, and we can so figure out what the Cherokee is, Cherokee word that they used and why. So those are just some of the things that we can use. And like I said, our teachers, like you get a math worksheet, they have taken the time to change the English that's on that math worksheet to Cherokee. Super time consuming. But um, not only do, we, do I try to teach with my program the Cherokee language, but I also try to teach culture and teach you know, the things that we do as Cherokee people that make us Cherokee. We go and we gather seasonal crops. Like we'll go out and we'll, we'll get ramps, which is wasp. Uh, we'll get sochan, which is a green. It's kind of like mustard greens. Um, and we'll go gather that. Um, we try to gather traditional Cherokee foods, mushrooms, um, and all of that. We try to make, I try to, this is a pot that I made right here. And this is a fire pot. And this is what we would carry um, coals in. So every year we would put our fires out in our towns, um, our, our campfires, things that we've had going, and we would go back to the mother town, to the main town, uh, Kadua, and we would go get fire from the first fire that we believe is the first fire that ever was. And we'd take it back. Well, we had fire pots to do that. Like these little knobby things aren't just for show. They helped disperse the heat in the pot so that, you know, if you touched it, you wouldn't get burned. Um, so this is just a replica. And remember the speaker I told you about, Lucille Lossie? Um, these are two of her baskets that she made. She loves working with river cane. Um, river cane is kind of like bamboo, but it's native to here. It's native to North America. Bamboo is not native to North America. North America is an invasive species. Um, but she takes these and she breaks down these big, huge, tall stalks and she dyes them herself and she weaves a basket. And this is one of her River King baskets. Oh, it looks so pretty. Sorry. I'm looking over at the, I couldn't help but look over at the TV because it's just so pretty. Um, she also works with white oak. And I don't know if you can see. Let me see if I can get it to, there we go. So all, you can kind of see all these little, little things right here. They're curly cues. So she has soaked these splints and she, um, so that they make these little curly cues. They're really pretty. So, and then Miss Louise Goines, she's another um, basket maker in the community. Um, she has taken and put syllabary on her basket. So everything that we do kind of intertwines language, crafts, um, it kind of all gets intertwined, so. So we have about 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes. So I'm going to be quiet now and I'm going to let y'all ask questions. Now, I am an open book. I believe if it is a sincere question that you like, I don't know if this is true, if this is real, I don't know, I need to know. If it is a, a question that you want to educate yourself, it's not stupid and it's not anything that I'm not going to answer or that, or that I'm going to be offended by because I'm here to educate and I'm here to make sure that you have what you need to be educated about Cherokees and about native people in general. So I'm going to let, um, I'm going to let, I'm not going to try to read. I'm just going to answer. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we have so many questions. People are really fascinated with what you're sharing. So about the language itself, do you know if there are different dialects among the different Cherokee nations? and why that may have occurred, if so. Yep, so there are. There are even different dialects within our community, um, but there are three different dialects that are Cherokee, EBCI, Cherokee Nation, and uh, Kadua. So Cherokee, Eastern Band of Cherokee, we're here in Western North Carolina. Um, Cherokee Nation and Kadua are in Oklahoma. Why is that? 
because of the trail of tears, because when they, when Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act and in 1838, um, Cherokee people were rounded up and they were taken to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma. Um, if you, if you look on maps now, it actually says the reservations because of a, a, a Supreme Court case that just happened in the past couple of years. Um, so yeah, it's pretty interesting, but anyway, but that's why, but like I said, even within our own communities, we have different dialects. Um, the gentleman in the top picture that I showed Mos Ukama, he speaks a lot different than even Rachel speaks. Um, but they, we all still understand each other. I was just in Oklahoma a month ago and, um, I was, I'm able to understand them. I could go into their room and, and still understand what they're saying. Um, it's like an English person listening to like a British person speak English because, you know, they have different ways of saying things and then they sound just a little bit different. They have the nice, very cool accent. I think they have a cool accent. Um, but we can still understand each other. So it kind of falls into the same thing. Does your group create tapes or videos to help Cherokee learn the language? They do. We actually just put a really cute um, um, skit up on Facebook. So um, we have two Facebook uh, pages. If you find one, you'll find the other. Um, we have the Cherokee, uh, East Cherokee, adult language master apprentice program. Um, I think it's EBCI. I think it's on my resource page. We can pop that back up in a minute and you can see it. Um, let me see. And then we also have one called Ani Yon. Um, it's a page on Facebook. So it's A-N-I-Y-O-N-A, -A, Ani Yon. Um, and those are my first year learners and they just did a really cute skit. Um, and then we put stuff up on the KPEP Facebook page. And then I have um, our website, the Odze Kadua, um, that you can go for resources as well. All right. Just so, stay away from YouTube. <laughs> stay away from YouTube. Okay. <laughs> so many uh, questions. Uh, people want to know about your jewelry. Is that Cherokee? Oh, yeah. Um, my earrings, they're bears. Um, my speaker, Mose, he's a carver. Um, he carved these. He just started making them. And I was like, one of the first ones to buy it. I was so excited. Um, one of my learners made this corn bead necklace. And then there's a wonderful silversmith, um, gray beard silversmith um, out of Cherokee. Um, she made my necklace and she makes absolutely gorgeous silver jewelry. Um, but she's an uh, Eastern, man, Eastern band member as well. So, yes. How do you say school? In Cherokee. Zundelo Guasti. You're going to have to say that again. Zundelo Guasti or Dideyo Guaski. Either way. Um, do you speak Cherokee in your home and are, do your children speak it better than you? <laughs> My youngest definitely speaks it better than me um, because she goes to the immersion school, but we do. We, um, we use it with one another. My oldest daughter is in um, high school, in a public school here in North Carolina. Um, so I couldn't convince her to come to school in Cherokee um, because they do. They learn they learn Cherokee language even at uh, Cherokee Central Schools up until um, high school. And then they can take it as an elective. Um, but I didn't want to tear her away from her friends. So but she learns, too. Um, and my husband even learns um, as well. Very so. cool. So are the numbers in Cherokee different as well? Um, the number of speakers, I'm guessing. No, um, like numerals. Oh, numerals. Oh, um, they're the same, but we just say them like, um, so we still use the number system like one through 10. Um, when we get into like, we count in tens. So if you know one through 10, once you get to 20, um, two is tall and 20 is tall. Shko. Three is Zo, and 30 is Zoshko. So we count like in tens almost. So it, it lends well to the new, I say it's new, but it's not new way that we teach things in math now. <laughs> All right. A quick yes or no question before we have to wrap up. 
Can people who are not Cherokee learn Cherokee? Is of that okay? Of course, yes, yes. I I say it's okay. This is a Cherokee person, and this is my opinion. You might you might get another opinion, but this is my opinion. Our language is endangered, and yes, languages can be endangered. And we have 151 fluent Cherokee speakers left. And I want anyone and anyone and everyone that wants to learn Cherokee language to be able to do that. I have a really close friend that I work with. He's not Cherokee, but he speaks Cherokee better than I do. And and my, one of the, the gentlemen that I work with is not Cherokee and he speaks. He knows so much. He's a linguist and he knows so much. So I think it's OK. Thank you, Chi. Thank you so much. We have so many more questions. Thank I you. hope people seek out your resources and we really appreciate you opening up this world for us today. Amen to God. Do?